Galaxy Solar PV TV once again from InterSolar North America 2017 from San Francisco. And now we, we are in our very interesting discussion actually, which is titled Stop Linear Thinking Solar Guys. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our speakers. So we start first with uh, Eckhart Guras, who is a uh, chief of, I would say, one of the most important and leading media in the solar industry, PV Magazine. Hello. Uh, we are with Tony Siba. For some people, I would say, man who needs no introduction. <laughs> the guy, thanks to whom I understood actually four years ago, that I should never be stressed. I just can be relaxed because the solar is disrupting everything. So we can just eventually help to make it uh, quicker. And we are also together with Alex Levren, one of the solar industry pioneers, person who was uh, managing solar activities at ABB. And since recently he's working for huge Chinese group, Sumai. So maybe I would like to start first with Tony. So yesterday we had a dinner and uh, we tried first to make a bit more awareness amongst the solar leaders yeah, that they should stop thinking in a linear way. Yeah? Yeah. They should think huge. Yes? This is a technology disruption. There are several technologies that are essentially going to disrupt uh, the energy and transportation industries. Batteries, solar PV, uh, um, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles. Essentially, each one of them is uh, in their own way disruptive, but when you put them together, uh, they're super disruptive. Um, and so solar, for instance, has come down in costs by about 11.5% per year since 1970. Uh, batteries have come down since 95, uh, lithium ion batteries, by about 16%. Um, and especially over the last six years, they've been coming down at a 20% per year rate. So if you take these technologies and you add business model innovation, essentially you can see the cost curve over the next three, five, 10, 15 years, assuming that they will continue to go down at these rates. And you can easily see how they're going to wipe out all of the energy and, trans uh, and transportation infrastructure uh, technologies that we've had for 100 years. Essentially, Edison and Tesla, Tesla Nikola, uh, if they woke up today, they would take a look at the industry and say, yeah, that's the industry that I created because it hasn't changed that much. So we're looking at a technology disruption uh, the same way that digital cameras disrupted film cameras, the same way that Netflix uh, video, online video disrupted blockbusters and so on. Um, that's what solar and batteries and electric vehicles and so on are going to do to energy and transportation. And here's the important thing. Um, a lot of mainstream analysts uh, forecast linearly. So they say, this year we installed 50 gigawatts of solar. We add 10% per year over the next few years. Uh, and that's what the installed base is going to look like by 2030, 2045, and whatever. And you don't agree with that, yeah? The reality is that no successful technology in the history of the universe has ever been adopted in a linear way. Um, they get adopted uh, on, as S-curves. So once they hit a tipping point, they grow super exponentially as S-curves. So they grow exponentially and they essentially take over the market 80% at least over a few months or over a few years uh, and so on. So uh, PV, for instance, the installed base has been growing at 41% per year mm -hmm. since the year 2000. So it, it's essentially doubling every two years. Um, and uh, if it's growing at 40% per year, why would it slow down to 10 or 11%, which is what the analysts are giving you, when right now, on the rooftop, solar is already in 80% in of the markets, cheaper than grid. Um, when uh, solar already today in the desert is at about three cents, which is cheaper than any other form of energy, cheaper than natural gas, cheaper than nuclear, cheaper than anything else. Um, so why would solar slow down? This is the moment when solar should even accelerate 
beyond the 40% per year growth. And the only thing, actually two things are stopping, uh, solar in particular, from eating all of energy, which it is going to by 2030. Two things, one is regulatory capture. Essentially regulators, the monopolies are not allowing solar. Um, so it's a fight, you have to ask for permission as an individual or as a, uh, a, a business to get solar on your rooftop, and that's not fair. I don't need permission to publish something, that's information. I don't need permission to make and sell items, right, things. Why do I need permission to um, generate my own energy and trade my own energy? Um, so that's basically caused by monopolies and regulatory capture. The second thing is batteries. So even in markets where solar has high penetration, Germany, Australia, and so on, um, the cost of batteries so far has been a little high. But because it's gone down by about 20% per year, essentially we can see the point where solar plus batteries will be cheaper than the cost of transmission. So essentially by 2019 or 2020 in most markets, solar on the rooftop plus storage is going to be cheaper than the cost of transmission. What that means, that's what I call God parity, not grid parity, is that even if utilities can generate at zero, bring the God particle from CERN in Switzerland, and generate at zero, um, when you add the cost of transmission, you still cannot compete with self-generation plus storage. Um, so at that point, Solar plus storage is going to be the selfish economic choice for individuals and businesses and so on. Uh, not the green choice, but the green as in uh, dollar green choice. And that's going to be the tipping point. And at that point, the 40% growth that we've had over the last 20 years or so be even is going to be even higher. Yeah. I mean, it's going to maybe double every year or uh, it's going to go to 60, 70, 80% per year as an S-curve, as an exponential S-curve until essentially solar eats all of energy. And the only other source that will survive that disruption, so distributed solar is going to eat everything. Um, and what distributed solar doesn't eat because of that exponential S-curve, over the next few years, I'm talking in the 2020s, early, um, it's essentially going to be utility scale solar because it's already at three cents in the desert and going down in cost. But in northern countries that don't get sunshine for weeks or months at a time, it's going to be wind. So wind is going to complement solar, um, but it's going to be a complement to solar because uh, of many reasons. Uh, you can't have distributed wind uh, in the home and in the cities and it still needs the cost of transmission and whatever but wind is gonna cost without subsidy i mean i'm talking about no subsidies uh wind is gonna eat everything else nukes uh, it, it already is cheaper than nukes and, and and it's getting to the point of coal um, and natural gas and so on and so forth so uh, the quick answer to the question is that these are technology disruptions, and technology disruptions are adopted, technology products and services are adopted as, as exponential S-curves, exponential X-curves, not uh, as exponential S-curves, not linear, uh, because no technology has been adopted linearly in the history of the universe. Uh, and that's why I'm so comfortable with the idea that Essentially, this is a disruption and it's going to happen and it's inevitable unless, of course, every government in the world um, agrees to push back on solar and on batteries and so on, which is not going to happen. Um, and, you know, in 2009, I predicted that solar was going to be three and a half cents per kilowatt hour by 2020. And, of course, folks said that's not going to happen. Um, and guess what? We're already there. Uh, it's 2017. And four years ago, I predicted... So you were too much linear, actually. <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 I you know, it, it, it's... Um, I'm using the technology cost curves and, you know, the the, the, the CBA technology disruption framework. Um, and, you know, four years ago, when we met, uh, basically with clean disruption, I predicted that by 2017, 2018, we would have, the market would bring several 
uh, electric vehicles with 200 mile range in the 35 to 40 thousand um, dollar price range, no subsidies. Guess what? We already have two, the GM Bolt and the Tesla Model 3, and Nissan has announced its 200 mile range vehicle. So by 2018, we're going to have several. And 200 miles is the minimum that you need to go mainstream. So, and at the time, four years ago, just four years ago, um, folks in the auto industry and the mainstream linear uh, analysts said, you're insane, but guess what? I'm right. I was correct to the month. Um, so, essentially, it, it doesn't take that much to, if you understand technology markets, to understand that once you hit that tipping point, essentially, uh, markets are adopted, uh, products are adopted as exponential S-curves. And that is what's about to happen with solar, with batteries, with electric vehicles. We're on the cusp of the most uh, transformative disruption in history um, since the Industrial Revolution in energy and transportation. Okay, so maybe now Alex, uh, so Alex, uh, you are one of the solar pioneers, you are entrepreneur, then you are working for leading inverter manufacturer, then you are leading the whole solar initiative at ABB, huge multinational, and now you change to very, let's say, strong Chinese conglomerate. And uh, even you are a solar pioneer, you are very dynamic, yes? And I think you don't agree actually with the linear um, point of view. I, I don't agree with linear. I, I uh, closer to Tony's opinion than linear. But there are certain factors that uh, damping the the exponential growth, uh, and we need to overcome these factors. One is uh, technology should contribute to uh, reduced cost at the higher profit. Okay, meaning panels, uh, inverters, uh, batteries. We need the industry to start making money. Otherwise, the financial element or economical element for growth is, is doesn't exist and it slows down the growth, okay? So this is number one. We need to use the technology in all elements, all components, and make it economical and profitable because there is no industry that grows on, on losses as we have seen for many years. The second element and you mentioned also in your discussion, Tony, which I agree, the regulation. When we have governments that impose tariffs, tariffs on the, uh, say, incoming goods and so on, instead of developing localized industry and helping the localized industry, the tariffs are very disruptive in a negative way. It slowed down the evolution of industry that was growing so fast and so beautiful. Now, in the past we had feed-in tariffs that were contributing to the growth. Now we have opposite tariffs that are slowing down the uh, uh, or income of, uh, or, or uh, sorry, import of goods to different countries. That is not uh, good for the industry if we would like to have exponential growth. And the third element is the interaction of uh, Regulation uh, related to grid connectivity, to batteries, to storage, safety related to storage, and all this has to come faster. Because if we don't have standards that help us to connect batteries today, then it slows down the installation of the batteries. And in spite of the fact that we know about technology, we can connect it to the grid. And the last but not least, there is, in, when we have today oversupply in certain areas, like you mentioned, Tony, in Germany, in, in California, we have oversupply of, of solar energy, which causes very big inefficiencies in the whole grid uh, energy uh, generation. We need to have a software platforms that are adequately supporting the Co connectivity of the batteries, storage, and how they employ uh, the solar energy, excessive solar energy, to charge the batteries on a grid levels, 
not home levels, because we at home it's very easy. We can charge the battery and, and the inverter or the converter can drive the charging. When you talk about utilities, it becomes very complex phenomena. We don't have the utility drive to develop these new tools to, to combine or interact the solar, the conventional central plants with battery and, and create this very effective methodology to drive the system to optimization and of course grow the profitability, grow the, the industry. So I, I do believe that we are at a very good point today. Technology is available, we understand what the interactions are and so on, but we need to push a little bit further on the government, on the technological advancement and financial benefits of the industry. So would you like to, Tony, uh, comment on that? Because I, um, So I, 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 I agree with, with uh, most of what you're saying, Alex. Um, you know, let me, I was an early employee at a then little company called Cisco Systems. Uh, and you know, Cisco has done pretty well in, in building the, the internet, uh, the worldwide internet infrastructure. Um, but most of the companies, and since you mentioned software, uh, who uh, generated most of the wealth. If you look at the top uh, wealth market valuation and profit making companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon, uh, Alibaba, and so on, they're software companies. Um, and even Apple could be considered a software company with mm -hmm. you know, a hardware products um, that are used as an excuse to basically sell the software. And you know, essentially these are the companies who created wealth on the infrastructure of the internet. And what I think is gonna happen, and is happening, is that we're building the internet of energy, and the internet of infrastructure, of, of, of transportation, and software is where the wealth is gonna be, yeah. and products that uh, basically are gonna be built on top of that infrastructure. Um, and essentially, so I agree with you, that we need to manage that, but we need to allow the market. I mean, we essentially need, just like um, the internet would not have happened in the US without the AT&T monopoly being broken up and deregulated, um, you know, the internet would have happened somewhere else. And Google and Facebook and so on, and Apple would not be in Silicon Valley, would not be American companies, they would be companies from another country. Um, and in fact, if you look at the history, um, France developed many of the technologies that essentially became uh, conceptually the internet with something called Minitel. And you know, basically five years before the web, uh, Minitel, you, you could make a, a, a train reservation, mm -hmm. you could date um, in France with the Minitel. It was in the 70s, no? It was in the sure. 80s, yeah. Um, but Minitel, where is Minitel? Nowhere. Because it was a monopoly. It was a France telecom monopoly. And essentially that squashed innovation. That did not allow entrepreneurs like, you know, the Google guys or the Facebook people or, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the Steve Jobs and of the world to create the business model innovations and the technologies on top of that telecom infrastructure. So essentially the web developed here in California in Silicon Valley because we opened up the, we broke up the telecom monopoly and the government essentially said that the telecom companies did not, could not hold back. Essentially if you're an internet service provider, you have the right to connect to the telecom infrastructure. Uh, today we have to ask for permission from the utility monopolies to connect to the grid. But and if we had that back then to connect to the uh, internet, essentially it wouldn't have happened the way it happened. So um, what we need is for the government to get out, uh, to deregulate the market so that uh, anybody has the right, anybody, any individual has the right to generate, store, and trade energy. I want the right to you know, store my energy and sell it to my neighbor if I want, that any company can uh, generate on their rooftop, uh, if you're an industrial customer, if you're a hotel and so on, their own uh, PV, uh, store it and sell it 
to anybody else. Um, and at the utility scale, we also want to store all the wind and all the solar and so on. But let the market make that happen. Uh, we essentially are not uh, going to succeed if we keep the monopolies that we have today, that's the vertically integrated monopolies, the utilities that are generating and storing and, and not storing, uh, uh, transmission and, and, and so on. And by uh, basically asking us to, uh, you know, go to the utility and ask for permission, we're essentially doubling the cost in the U.S., um, you know, a dollar, a dollar fifty out of two and a half dollars of the installed cost of rooftop solar is essentially regulation. So we need regulation out of the way. We do need standards, uh, but this is a 50-year industry. It's not like, you know, PV is going to catch fire or, I mean, you know, basically this is a 50-year-old industry with a lot of standards. Uh, we need to have standards, but we need the freedom for individuals to, this is about liberty. Um, and we need the freedom for anybody to generate and store and trade energy, just like we have freedom to make things and sell things, atoms, and just like we have freedom to publish things, information. So why do we have freedom of information and of making things, atoms, um, but we don't have the freedom to generate and sell energy? That doesn't make any sense. So we need the government, we need the regulatory approval to ease we need to deregulate the monopolies uh, and let the market compete. And when we do that, essentially, we're going to ease the, the, the transition, the disruption, because entrepreneurs are going to make it happen, because they're going to build the software, the applications, the tools, the power electronics, and so on, that are going to make a lot of money, because otherwise they would not get funded. Um, and many of them are going to be acquired by the large companies. Many of them are going to go public and become the Googles of energy and so on and so forth. So I'm in agreement. We need to essentially deregulate the industry and let the market work. Okay, so now um, Eckhart, yeah? so thank you so much for, for your patience. Yeah? But uh, I think it was a very, very exciting uh, discussion. I would like to ask you, Eckhart, because uh, you are owner of uh, one of the most important media in solar. Mm -hmm and you are speaking as an owner with uh, C-level people uh, in the industry and on the globe. Do you still notice you know, this linear thinking amongst the leaders? Or you can notice that it's a bit changing towards the exponential thinking? Well, I, I guess it's a, it's a long-term process, Tomas. You know, I think solar was sort of a niche play, and you know, it, it, it took a while to kind of be even noticed in the energy world. And I think, you know, we have come a long way, but maybe one still has that mindset, you know, we're still kind of new to the big energy party. And, but now it's going so fast, we re really should seize, you know, and say, hey, this industry is really poised for exponential, is growing exponentially, and it opens all sorts of opportunities. And we should have even more confidence to go out there and say, hey, we're really the energy of the future. And what does that entail? And, and so I, I, I think it's a very exciting time, and I think one has to rethink, and I think all of us have to, and I think this is great to think about, hey, this is exponential growth. What does that mean? I used to be in telecoms, and I watched how you know, it used to be expensive to talk to you if you were in another country. Per minute, you would pay even a dollar. And now we have Skype, and I could see you, and we're paying nothing. So that has been, and, and so how many minutes flow through, flow, flow through Skype? It just, the market has become so much bigger. So I think that, you know, we're going to go through that with, with PV, and especially combined with low-cost storage. And, and so I think it's going to be in a very, very exciting time in the next, you know, few years. But I think also it's a, an exciting time, especially for guys like you and me, yes, who are representing the media mm. within the industry also, yes, because yeah. I think it's so important, you know, to make aware our leaders, yeah, that we should not be so conservative, yeah. yeah. And even you see, uh, you remember Hans Josef Feld, what he said, yeah, yeah. guys, you are not enough ambitious, yeah. So why right. Hans Josef Feld, who is a politician, should say to the business guys, yeah, that they should be ambitious, yeah. So I think yeah. maybe it would be important also that we make more awareness first amongst us, yes. 
No, definitely. And I think it's great also to bring, you know, someone like Tony in more and with his vision, his knowledge and, 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 and you know, experience with exponential growing industries. You know, what is possible, what has hindered industries in the past. Like you were talking about, why didn't the UK, England, become the place where cars really took off? Because they had some crazy rule that you had to have people with a red flag, you know, <laughs> following the cars because of some danger they, they thought. So, um, you know, as, and then we could, you know, help communicate that to the, our industry and like you're doing also to other industries. Yes, exactly. So, um, and what do you think, guys? Uh, because, uh, as you know, I, I have also the associ associative background, yes? And very often within the organizations, you need to be quite um, conservative because you are representing different companies, yes? And in order to take a decision within the companies, it takes some time, yeah? And uh, why don't we come up with some forecast yeah? together, like mm. media, uh, having on the board Tony, and making the forecast, which for some people maybe seem to be crazy, but mm. in my opinion, actually, it will be the final and the, the, the truly one. Yeah? Because Tony, you know, Tony is the exponential guy. Mm. But even in his forecast in 2009, mm -hmm. he was too much linear. Yeah? <laughs> what do you think about this, Tony? Would you, would you help our, let's say, industry, our media to work together on making this kind of forecast? Absolutely. And, you know, I have, um, basically, that's what I'm doing. I'm developing, I started a think tank called RethinkX, where I'm studying disruption and its implication for societies. And uh, our first report, Rethink Transportation, essentially has a forecast of how the transportation industry is going to be disrupted by 2030. And essentially, we forecasted that 95% of all road transportation is going to be electric, autonomous, and on demand by 2030, 95%. Um, and so essentially I'm doing that and in clean disruption I forecast that by 2030 essentially solar will have eaten all of energy uh, and wind. Uh, but solar is going to be by far the biggest uh, disruptor and the biggest share by 10 to 1 at least uh, and wind is going to be second. So uh, I am doing that and I'm going to continue to do that in different industries in energy, transportation, agriculture, healthcare and, and, and so on and so forth. So and I'm making all of that research available free um, rethinkx.com. Essentially that's what I'm doing. And uh, I think the industry is starting to pay attention. So do you think that uh, it would be useful if we invite, uh, let's say, industry leaders also to give you the feedback, the input? So what industry leaders, essentially when you look at the history of disruption, mm -hmm. um, it's not the incumbents who make the disruptions happen. It's outsiders. Mm -hmm. So essentially the folks who are, are going to disrupt transportation the, the autonomous vehicle companies, Google, for instance, uh, the electric vehicle companies, Tesla, for instance, BYD, for instance, are outsiders. These were not companies that were in the car business 20 years ago. They're not the existing OEMs. Because uh, insiders were linear. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, they have also their linear thinkers mm -hmm. because, you know, they look at history and they say the industry has grown by... 5% per year every year. So our forecast is that it's going to keep growing at 5%, 10%. Because we have suppliers of pieces, they need to increase the production. All of that, is. right? And so they see the future as an extension, linear extension of the past. But when you come from the outside, when you're a Google or a Facebook or um, uh, an Apple and so on, you have nothing to lose. And so essentially that's how you, you can disrupt the market uh, because the incumbents have a sweet cash flow, right, to, to protect the utilities and the auto companies and so on. Um, and essentially they can't think outside that cash flow. And, you know, if, if you think about Kodak, Kodak invented digital cameras. They invented digital imaging, and yet they were disrupted by digital cameras. Mm -hmm. How is that possible? They, they not only knew the technology, they invented it. Uh, and the reason was that they were addicted to the cash flow, uh, to the existing business model. They could not disrupt themselves. That's a very difficult thing to do, both culturally and also from a financial point of view. Uh, so we are making uh, our uh, industry leaders a bit stressed, yeah? Uh, they, they, they should be, uh, because uh, they should 
see this as an existential threat. Mm. I mean, within a couple of years, you're going to see utilities, if they're not deregulated, come back to governments and ask, you're going to see coal power plants asking for subsidies. You're going to see natural gas power plants uh, asking for subsidies. You're going to see basically um, the old energy systems asking for subsidies because they can't compete with solar and wind. Mm -hmm. And that is going to start happening within two years. You're going to see the utility industry on its knees. Well, and it's already happening with the trade measures. I think that's indirectly probably the traditional energy industry looking for ways to protect itself from the solar menace. Yes, yes, exactly. So they're asking not just for subsidies, but for protection yeah. uh, from the disruptors. And when you ask for protection from disruption, all you're doing is postponing that disruption in your country, right? So essentially, all you're doing is making your citizens poorer, and all the innovation that is going to happen is going to happen in another country. Um, so if in the United States, for instance, um, we push back against clean disruption, against solar and against batteries and against um, electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles and so on, essentially all we're doing is postponing that disruption in the U.S. But all we're doing is making China great again. Uh, China is going to make all of these uh, technologies happen. Um, they have invested in our, and are committed to making big you know battery infrastructure and solar and ev and so on um, autonomous vehicles so why because they're the outsider i mean they, they they're not the ones who are going to protect a 100 year old electricity industry or car industry and so on in this case they are the disruptor um, and just like uh, america became the 20th century world power uh, in, in a big way because the UK stopped its own auto industry with the Red Flag Act, that's what it's called, where you know essentially the horse carriage industry plus the railroad industry lobbied against this new thing called the car. Um, and so they had this red, you know, they, the, 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 they passed this regulation that you had somebody who had to walk in front of the car 60 feet in front to 20 feet in front of the car essentially uh, because it was dangerous and blah 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 <coughs> if we do that in the u.s with autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles and so on all we're going to do is essentially export the disruption allow another country to become <coughs> the world center the silicon valley of energy and transportation just like the uk uh, essentially that's why Alex enabled. is so smiling eh? because he's working one for, uh, for the Chinese company. Now. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> essentially the UK by looking inwards uh, and protecting its old industries, they allowed the new industry, auto industry, which by the way, uh, by 1950 was generating six, um, one, out of, uh, one out of every six jobs in America in 1950. Um, was essentially from the auto industry and also the auto industry helped us win the world war ii uh, because they were the ones who built tanks and and bombs and, and 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 airplanes and so on because we had that infrastructure uh, and if we hadn't had it things could have turned out differently so america became the world power in the 20th century in big part because the uk turned protectionist and turn inwards. And if we turn protectionist and inwards, essentially we're going to allow China to be the America of the 21st century. Um, and essentially we're not going to, you know, um, be the leaders. The Silicon Valleys of energy and transportation uh, are going to be based in China, not in the U.S. Okay, so uh, because, because Alex uh, was smiling, yes? so you are working, Alex, for Sumec, which is uh, part of the big conglomerate uh, and uh, you know the CEO of Sumex since 10 years and as Tony was saying China is now becoming the new disruptor yes in the new industry can you confirm that and uh, how do you see you know working with uh, the Chinese leadership and do they also feel this opportunity now on the market well I uh, cannot speak for Mr. Chai the, the president of Sumex uh, 
although I know him very well. But I can say that uh, I fully agree that uh, uh, the outsiders and China in energy was outsider. I agree with you completely. They elected to go after the renewable energy because they needed the clean energy sources simply because the pollution levels were so high. So electrical vehicle, the electricity generated by solar, electricity generated by wind, where they became uh, very strongly the leaders of uh, the, the free world, came as a necessity to create new industry and jobs, but also as a necessity b because they had no choice. It's, it's a, a something that they needed to, to survive with the uh, pollution levels and both chemical underground and, and air and all this. So yeah, they, they are now the leaders and they're developing electrical vehicles, they're developing batteries, they're developing um, uh, solar, wind, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, coming back to, to your point, uh, to, to get uh, uh, a, a conglomerate of uh, different uh, companies and, and define the, the goals for the industry and the, how the exponential uh, growth should happen, I would recommend that we'll have three different institutions. One is utilities because we still have utilities that do not believe in renewables, okay? Now, we have the, other, the opposite sign in Europe where utilities are uh, selling the non, uh, the conventional utilities becoming only renewable. But here in the United States, we still have a little bit of a pushback by the utilities to the renewable resources. So number one, we should include in this utilities. We should include Department of Energy and and, and the government, because they need to allow the, 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 the regulation to be <clears throat> more uh, supportive to the industry, and then, of course, the industry um, uh, members themselves. But I don't see companies that will object to grow renewables mm -hmm. as much as utilities or the government. And if all three will work in harmony, then we'll get exponential growth. Then we'll get exponential growth. Do you agree with this, uh, Eckhart? No, I think that's well said, Alex. If all three, then certainly growth will happen much faster. I somehow think it's inevitable that it will happen, you know, and, and, and uh, but I think at some point also it's very important at the end of voters, grassroots. If that support, like in Nevada we saw, there was a big pushback. Now it's a bill of rights to kind of yep. create your own energy. Who would have thought they, they they got rid of net metering? It looked like Nevada would be a you know wouldn't be very solar friendly. Now it's again even more solar friendly than before they got rid of the net metering. So I think grassroots support is very important. It will ultimately also bring the government and then the utilities over to our side, so to speak. So do you agree, guys, that since today our main message will be to the audience: stop thinking linear solar guys <laughs> yes of course and that's the way technology markets work stop thinking linearly think exponentially okay so thumbs up for solar yeah. thumbs up yay <laughs> and we uh, as media of course uh, with Eckhart with PV magazine will make uh, this message you know distributed widely yes, sure. yes. Okay, sure. thank you so yeah. much thank you thank you so much for coming and that was solar TV TV from InterSolar North America 2017 from San Francisco uh, with the easy, clear message. Stop thinking in linear way, solar guys. Now there is a time for exponential growth. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.